Okay, the next item of business is debate on motion 15205 in the name of Natalie Don Innes on keeping the promise. I'd invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Natalie Don Innes to speak to and move the motion. Minister, around 13 minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, for the opportunity to bring this debate to the Chamber today. As Minister for the Promise, I have seen progress listened to heartwarming stories and witnessed the energy and the activity underway across Scotland to bring change. But I've also listened to what needs to improve. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to come together across the Chamber to reaffirm the promise that we have all made on every seat of this Parliament to our children and young people with care experience. This debate and motion provide an opportunity for all of us here in this Chamber to make clear to Scotland's care experienced citizens that each and every one of us has a responsibility to keep the promise we made to you four years ago. And indeed, I welcome the amendment made by Martin Whitfield to this motion, which upholds this core principle. And the important thing when it comes to decision time this evening is that this Parliament comes together to reaffirm our commitment to the promise. So on that note, let me first start by addressing those children, young people, adults and families across Scotland with care experience. This government is committed to ensuring that families receive the right support in the right way and at the right time. Both myself and the First Minister are clear that keeping the promise is not an ambition in isolation. It's aligned closely with our programmes of work to tackle child poverty and reduce the number of families in crisis. I know that we need to keep moving to make change happen and I know that in some areas we need to move faster. But I also know that there is so much work underway and an incredible drive across organisations, systems and our communities to bring the change that is required. I want to reassure you that progress is being made and I'm committed to making this happen and I'm com committed to working with you all to make it happen. And in that spirit of collaboration, let me too acknowledge all the people and the organisations across Scotland who are focused on delivering change. Our social workers, our teachers, our health workers, our emergency service workers, our volunteers, our public sector, both local and national, our third sector and our communities across Scotland. Thank you. Your commitment and hard work is evident and it is so, so welcome. So let's keep going together. And to my colleagues across this parliament, I'm sure you're poised to provide the challenge that this chamber is so effectively designed for us to do. But let's keep in mind that we have all across parties jointly committed to change and we must jointly move in a solution focused way to keep that promise and build upon its five foundations, voice, family, care, people, scaffolding. Presiding officer, in March 2022, this government published a comprehensive plan that set out the actions and commitments. In September this year, we published a detailed update on progress against each of these actions. Since the Promise Oversight Board's second report was published last year, there have been a number of developments, including the publication of Plan 2430 in June of this year by the Promise Scotland. And I extend my thanks to Fiona Duncan, Independent Strategic Advisor on the Promise and co-chair of the Promise Oversight Board, who continues to work hard with her team to set the route map for what needs to be done, by whom and when. Ms Duncan's assessment that we remain on track to keep the promise by 2030 furthers my confidence that we can, and together we will. And the evidence is clear, as I say, that progress is being made. Indeed, early evidence demonstrates the 15.6% reduction in the number of looked-after children in Scotland since 2020. And whilst I fully appreciate that this does not tell us the full story, it does tell us the system is changing. We are safely keeping more families together and we are changing our approach to better meet children and families' needs. At the heart of this is the whole family wellbeing funding programme. For example, in South Lanarkshire, funding has supported the scaling up of centralised family support hubs, which have contributed to a reduction in referrals to statutory services by over 60%, early support that has avoided crisis intervention. 
And for our children and young people who do require to enter care, we know that for some this may be for short periods, for others it may be longer term. The promise tells us developing a universal definition of care experience will help more people understand and relate to what it means to be a person with experience of care. This work is underway and I would like to thank Who Cares Scotland and Bernardo's and all the children, young people and stakeholders engaging in events across Scotland to inform this. The contribution made by our kinship carers, our foster carers and foster families, where it is not safe and possible for children and young people to remain with birth families, is of the highest value. And I reiterated this message when I met with the Kinship Care Advice Services Advisory Group just yesterday. Of course. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for the Minister taking an intervention. And I think the definition um, is, is becoming one of, one of the most important elements of this. And it's right that the definition is developed with those with care experience and those that surround them. But can the Minister give an indication of how far along that pathway she feels we are? And will we get to um, a definition before we have to address the question of the bill? Minister. We are consulting on, so I should thank Mr Whitfield for the intervention and would say that we are consulting on this matter and this is absolutely something that will be um, uh, considered in anticipation of the bill, so absolutely. I was very proud in August 2023 to introduce the Scottish Recommended Allowance for Kinship and Foster Carers, which benefits over 9,000 families and for the first time ensures every eligible foster and kinship carer receives at least a standard national allowance. And last week we launched a new kinship care assessment framework intended to assist social work practitioners to assess kinship carers and their needs. I recently met with foster carers and their families in Perth, where I launched the next stage of our work to set out a vision for the future of foster care in Scotland, a vision that prioritises children's experiences to best meet their varied needs. It is vital that Scotland has enough capacity to provide loving care, and in 2025, we will prioritise a national campaign to recruit more foster carers. Of course, Scotland's children's hearing system continues to play a pivotal role in our support and decision making. And I am very grateful to SCRA and to Scotland's diverse pool of panel members who continue to support children, young people and families who attend hearings. I'm also very grateful to Sheriff Mackey for the work he's undertaken with those with lived experience of the children's hearing system to lay the foundations for a redesign of this system that best meets the needs of our children and young people. The next stage of development in advance of legislative and non-legislative change required is underway. In May 2024, I was honoured to support the Children's Care and Justice Act into law. This has already facilitated an end to the placement of children in young offenders institutions in Scotland. And for our children and young people engaged with the justice system, system We've taken a significant step forward with the Bairns Who's Pathfinders and affiliate test sites underway, backed by investment of £10 million. For our young people transitioning out of children's services, I recognise that at this stage in life you may still need access to financial, practical and emotional support. And we continue to work closely with corporate parents and our partners to better coordinate and make available the support required by those leaving care. We will continue to make improvements in the year ahead, including through the development of the Care Lever payment, which will be co-designed with care experienced people and those who support them. We will also take forward action in response to what we have heard through the recent moving on from care into adulthood consultation and Care Inspectorate thematic review on transitions for care experienced young people. As Minister, I have had the privilege to visit a broad range of projects and to meet some incredible care experienced children and young people along the way. And I am really encouraged by the quality of work underway throughout Scotland. In education, we have provided over £60 million to local authorities through the Care Experienced Children and Young People Fund, and we have seen real successes in schools across Scotland through the Virtual Head Teacher Network and other supports that aim to increase attendance, improve attainment and reduce exclusion. In housing, I have met staff and young people involved in the Midlothian House Project and heard about the real impact that that team has had on their lives. A project that won the Outstanding Corporate Parent Award at the first Corporate Parenting Award ceremony held last August. 
Through the Promise Partnership Fund, we have supported projects such as the Aberlour Perinatal Befriending Service, an early intervention approach for mothers and mothers-to-be with mild to moderate perinatal mental health illnesses. And I recently visited Young Scott and spoke to young people about their experiences transitioning out of care and heard about the difference the Promise is making and how those young people can see that changes are happening. I know that good things are happening in every corner of Scotland on the promise, and I encourage local systems to challenge themselves, to learn from each other, to continue to build a culture where the best of practice is the reality for all children and their families. Understanding progress made so far is essential in ensuring that we remain on track, but also so that we can flex and direct that attention where it is required, informing the Oversight Board for the promise, as it holds all of Scotland to account on progress. And I do know that statistics alone are not enough, and we will continue to ensure that the voices of our care experienced children and young people remain at the heart of our story of change. For example, our joint work with COSLA and the Promise Scotland to develop the Promise Stories of Progress will launch by the end of this year. Now, as I have set out, implementing change requires partnership across the board. And to help enable this, the Government is committed to introducing a Promise Bill in this Parliament, which I hope we will be able to pass with cross-party support. Again, in the spirit of collaboration and keeping in mind the collective promise all of us have made to care experienced children and young people, I hope that all parties here in this chamber will commit to work constructively together on that legislation when it is brought forward. Presiding officer, I bring this motion forward to acknowledge the commitment this parliament made to keep the promise to care experienced people by 2030. This Government's focus is on action that will help children, young people and families across Scotland. Keeping the promise will have benefits for everyone in Scotland, and that is why the legislation that we will introduce by the end of this parliamentary term will provide the further direction that we need. By voting in favour of this motion, members will send a message to the children, young people, adults and families across Scotland with care experience that their voice matters. They will be supported in the years ahead and that the promise we made as a parliament four years ago will not be broken. I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Rose McCall to speak to and move Amendment 1520 at 5.2 uh, around nine minutes. Ms McCall. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to start by thanking the Minister for bringing this important de debate to the Chamber. I welcome the opportunity to reaffirm the commitment on the Scottish Conservative benches to the promise. I would also like to state up front apologies for the small error in our amendment and my thanks go to the presiding officer and the team for, for sorting that. Um, we must never forget that it was not only the promise that was made and agreed by all parties in this place, but it was a promise that was made to make tangible change to the lives of care experienced people in Scotland and that's a promise we must not break. It's no surprise to anyone that this topic is of a personal interest to me. I've listened to many care experienced people over the years and the need for action now is still, unfortunately, just as important as it was 20 years ago when my husband and I embarked on the journey to foster and adopt. And I want to state as well that I note the tone of the motion. We will be voting for it. It would, but it would be remiss of me, and I'm sure Ms Don Innes is well aware that I would take every opportunity to express concerns raised by stakeholders about a lack of progress and time delays regarding the implementation of various parts of the promise, and I'm doing so in this debate. We rarely have a chance to debate this issue, so forgive me for taking that opportunity when it arises. But before I do that, I do think it's right and fair that I recognise the good work done so far. There's certainly been a pivotal change in the way that children and families are supported. The drive to keep siblings together has meant that more and more young people are cared for with their brothers and sisters, and that's a good thing. We know that attachment is essential to strong relationship building, and these family bonds play a crucial role. And I'm looking forward to the quarter that are remaining that don't actually stay with their family and are separated to becoming a thing of the past. There has been a move towards redesigning the children's hearing process. And whilst I may have some reservations that the intentions will be met, it is right that we listen to children, families and care-experienced adults 
and we place them at the centre of decisions about their lives. I would also like to raise concerns over the treatment of volunteers and the lack of transparency over staffing decisions, but that could be taken into consideration with the redesigning process. And with the increased role of children's hearing, we must be mindful that everyone who gives of their time for the good of our children, while well, they need to be respected and offer the same protections as employees. And even though there's a long way to go, it is excellent to see that the shift in supporting young people are moving on from care into adulthood. That understanding that the corporate parenting is just like any other form of parenting and it doesn't stop when a person reaches 18 is a welcome shift towards supporting care experienced adults and that should be applauded. But I want to thank the, oversight, the Promise Oversight Board for their continued work in ensuring that the Promise Scotland has a continu is continually assessed. It's concerning that they've raised fears over a lack of focus and this is a sentiment echoed by the Promise Scotland themselves when it comes to what is more required from the Scottish Government. And I thank them for their briefing for today in which they state there needs to be a step change in pace and scale, to which I agree. At a recent meeting with the Promise Oversight Board, I recognise their frustration at a lack of drive behind achieving the remaining objectives and a disappointment over an absence of the next steps for Plan 24 to 30 and a dearth of grassroots changes from the previous plan of 21-24 that will actively make, a make immediate improvements for those experiencing on, on the edge of care. The Oversight Board correctly highlighted their concerns earlier this year when it said that Plan 21-24, the strategic implementation, implementation of what needs to happen each year to achieve the promise, will not be fulfilled. And it has concluded that the original aims of the plan will not be achieved by the end of the year. Well, we're at the end of the year, and I fear they're right. It cannot be acceptable, as highlighted by Who Cares Scotland, in October 24 report, that income gaps for care-experienced individuals have grown from 25 to 29%, as much, and as much to 38%, sorry, amounting to a total of nearly £10,000 a year. These issues are all there and they must be addressed. We must make sure that this does not happen again when we implement the objectives over the next five years to ensure that the deadline for 2030 is met. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'd like to take a moment to specifically look at the whole Family Wellbeing Fund. It was mentioned by Ms. Um, in, uh, Don Innes. This £500 million fund in place to make ground support for families as accessible as possible. A fund in place till the end of this Parliament solely for projects in the community. This was even highlighted to me by um, Ms Sturgeon, who is, is in the Chamber today, and I'm, I'm glad she's here. Um, this is an important fund, and it is instrumental in keeping the promise. And I note the comments from the Promise Scotland when it states that there must be a renewed effort, building on strong emphasis of whole family support in the recent programme for government, to ensure that all families are able to access emotional, practical and financial support to stay together whenever it's safe to do so. So it's therefore concerning to find that from a freedom of information request that most councils are currently using the fund to supplement their own staffing requirements, mm -hmm. which is not the intention of the fund. And it raises concern that the original objectives might not be met by the full funding allocation. It would be a pity if implementation was again the downfall of this project. And I urge the Minister to look at how outcomes of the fund will be measured rather than money spent. And that was certainly alluded to in her um, opening remarks. It's also disappointing to hear, as Bernard was high right for its briefing for today, that the Scottish Government's promised plan progress update of 24, that investment in the whole family wellbeing fund will remain static and that the 500 million commitment will not be delivered by 2026. Now, whilst I understand the financial limitations that the Scottish Government will not undoubtedly mention, it is incumbent on this Government to literally put its money where its mouth is and show its full commitment to keeping the promise. Presiding officer, I do want to realise the time and I do want to sort of uh, wind up. Who Cares Scotland highlighted in their report of February this year to 2023 that the highest levels of social work absence due to sickness showing a rise from 65% to, in 2021 to 83.3% in one local authority, has highlighted a problem within social, um, social work within our local authorities. Each year, a different authority has the highest level of staff absence, showing that it's a nationwide problem. 
And with a UK market rate average for employee sickness at 2.6%, this is demonstrating an alarming crisis in social work in our local authorities. We know it's not only that we, do, we know that we don't have enough social workers. We know that retention rate is low with mostly newly trained social workers leaving the profession within four years. And we know that we can't keep the promise without them. So I urge the Minister to ensure strategic leadership is at the forefront moving forward. So in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I recognise the work already done, but there's so much more we need to do. Now is not the time to step back, it is the time to step up. I'm up for the challenge. I'm sure the Government is. Thank you. Move the amendment, please. Move the amendment. Thank Very you. grateful. Thank you. I now call on Martin Whitfield to speak to and move Amendment 15205.1, around seven minutes. Mr Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as a proud member of the Children's Parliament and Fierties, I stand with children to make rights real in day-to-day -day life. And today, as part of that journey, I stand here and reaffirm Scottish Labour's commitment to keeping the promise by 2030. And I hope to join with all across the Chamber in reaffirming this Parliament's commitment to keep the promise by 2030 at decision time. The journey has not been easy, and I am minded of those care-experienced children and young people who do not feel that the promise has changed anything for them. I hope that this rapidly becomes a historic feeling. It is, however, in this reality that we must look at where we are today. The cultural shift that we've begun to see around how we support care-experienced young people is not insignificant. And the importance of capitalising on any momentum is absolutely essential. The momentum must not abate. We are but 2,191 days from this date in 2030. The members will recall my contributions, indeed may balk at my contributions, when the UNCRC legislation came about with its passage and the constant reminder of time that had passed. 2,191 days. This is all the time we have until this date in 2030, a period of time that is a long time in a young person's life, from birth all the way through to P2, from P1 through to P6, from S1 to S6, but not so long in the time required to implement the promise. To this end, I am extremely grateful to the Minister regarding the assurances with regard to the Promise Bill and indeed the amendment in my name, and I welcome this openness. But I want to begin by echoing the remarks of the Promise Scotland and acknowledge and celebrate the fact that over the last four and a half years, substantial progress has been made towards keeping the promise in Scotland. Change has happened. We have dedicated, hard-working people going the extra mile while well, actually in all probability going the extra 10 miles to implement the promise. They work on the relationships with care-experienced young people. They support young people in the important transition into adulthood, doing all they can, as we've heard, to keep siblings together, to ensure children and young people feel loved, and to see care-experienced adults receive the support that they need. And I want to take a moment to celebrate them, to thank them, because without them, no change is possible. And I also want to thank the 5,500 children, young people, families, care-experienced adults, members of the paid and unpaid workforce who shared their story with the Independent Care Review. I cannot imagine how difficult it must have been to do this. It is up to us and up to the government to act on what they have been told. We have heard time and time again how important getting this right is, reminded of just quite how important the promise is to those directly affected. And yet, instead of acting, for example, by bringing forward legislation with urgency and properly funding and resourcing the workforce, we are here again, reissuing the promise. It is important. It's arguably one of the most important things we can achieve as a parliament. But it's also important for the government. It's important for the government to show up, to show how important it is, and not just repeat the messages. When the Promise Oversight Board came in to meet with MSPs last month, they highlighted the reality still faced by social workers, children, young people in care and those around them. The job is not yet done. And as the Conservative Amendment in the name of Ros McCall today correctly highlights, there is so much we still have to do, so many ways in which we can continue to fail care-experienced children and young people and adults if we let it happen. We see the educational outcome for care-experienced young people. 
looked after school leavers staying on after S5, down 2.7 per cent. Looked after school leavers with one or more qualifications at SCQF level 4 or better, down 2.6 per cent year on year. Exclusions going up, attainment gaps falling. I'm grateful to the Minister for the offer she has said to extend to work cross-party on the Promise Bill and I look forward to those conversations and discussions and also the debates that of course we will have here in this chamber but I will do so with contributions and with ideas. I'm heartened by the latter stages of the climate legislation passed only yesterday that shows this government can operate in this manner and the bar has now been set for this Minister. We can stand here in this chamber and discuss how much we can stand here in this chamber and discuss how much we want to keep the promise, but without this bill, without the tangible and measurable action and progress, it is nothing more than wishful thinking. The foundations for this include clear, transparent funding, showing us, actually showing more importantly, children and young people and their families who so desperately need the promise that the Scottish Government are serious about this. Hence, the disappointment that the Scottish Government's Promise Plan Progress Update 2024 the investments in the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund will remain static and the £500 million commitment will not be delivered by 2026. The Scottish Government can't make a legitimate promise, or indeed a promise with legitimacy, and expect it to be delivered without taking on the substantive action towards delivering it. The Government have a destination, the Government have a route map, the Government have the support of this Parliament. But it is up to the government to start that driving. Today, we are debating and voting to reaffirm the whole parliament's commitment to keeping the promise. I think we must now move from that foundation of keeping the promise to the structure that is delivering the promise. Delivery requires action today, not just a promise of action tomorrow. Delivering on growing up loved, delivering on growing up safe, delivering on growing up respected and delivering all of this before 2030, a mere 2,191 days from today. I move the amendment in my name, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Mr Whitfield. I now call on Gillian Mackay, who joins us remotely uh, around six minutes. Ms Mackay. Thanks. Deputy Presiding Officer, I too would like to thank the Minister for bringing this debate forward. It's hugely important. And as others have done, I also reaffirm the Scottish Greens' commitment to achieving the promise. I don't think anyone could argue with what the promise is at its heart. The recognition that, that there remain important structural and societal barriers for care experienced people reminds us of the urgency by which these should be dismantled. What we've done so far and how we've pushed progress forward is really important. And I think if the importance of an issue could purely be measured in the number of briefings and emails we receive on it, then this should be a very high priority for the whole chamber. In terms of steps forward, the Promise Scotland highlighted the Children's Care and Justice Bill in their briefing for today. My colleague Ross Greer managed to secure amendments to that bill that seek to improve the way that secure transport is delivered and scrutinised. The transport for provision for young people in secure care had been a bit of a missing link when it comes to the gradual raising of standards, quality and accountability in recent years. The Hope Instead of Handcuffs campaign also raised the profile of this issue. They highlighted that children in Scotland were being inappropriate, inappropriately restrained when in the care of secure transport providers, including using handcuffs in situations where they were simply not necessary. The use of restraint against children has rightly been the subject of significant scrutiny and debate, both in this Parliament and in Council Chambers across Scotland. And I gladly note that progress has been made in relation to schools specifically, with much more improved guidance being produced. The availability of secure transport was also an issue. As the committee heard, due to the lack of specialist providers in Scotland, transport was coming from hundreds of miles away to take young people relatively short distances. This isn't good for the young people or providers. But, presiding officer, as the plan 24 to 30 document says, keeping the promise will never not be urgent. Childhood is short and precious. This should focus minds on how we continue the pace of change and how we adapt current plans when issues arise. Support for families and early intervention has been raised by several organisations. 
helping families to thrive, giving support and guidance before crisis is essential to keeping the promise. The whole family wellbeing fund has been hailed as a positive step forward, but many families are still finding it difficult to navigate systems when they need help. We must also remain aware of how budgets impact on the financing of third sector and other organisations who provide support and advocacy to families, as well as the effects on funds like the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund. Whole Family Wellbeing Fund projects in themselves can't sustain many third sector organisations, and we know that financial positions are difficult, but it's often too easy to cut funding for some of this vital work in order to plug gaps in statutory services. The reality is that many of these third sector organisations are either catching people who don't qualify for support or are preventing people from needing to go to statutory services in the first place. I've attended a few events with organisations like Who Cares Scotland, speaking directly to young people who are care experienced, hearing from them what they need from us. Kinship care and relationships with siblings were often mentioned. There was a perception that kinship care is often dismissed as it can be too difficult to establish or that only immediate family were considered for kinship care. The definition of kinship care in Scottish Government guidance is actually pretty broad, but it seems in certain cases they, this may not be being explored to its full extent. I was going to ask the Minister for an update on work in this space, but I'm grateful to her for outlining some of the measures that are underway. I am interested particularly in the guidance being given to social work to support kinship care. If she has any further information, either now or at a later point, I'd be hugely grateful for that detail. As Ros McCall mentioned, there has been some progress on keeping siblings together, but the briefing from the Promise once again raises the issue of lack of contact with siblings for care experienced people. This is an issue I've heard repeatedly from children and young people right across the country, and one that appears we aren't getting quite right every time yet. There needs to be a consistency of approach for siblings who each have individual plans and orders through the hearing system to make sure that the system that's supposed to support them is not putting competing orders in place with differing contact requirements. Not taking wider circumstances and important people in the care experience young person's life into account isn't getting it right for that child or young person. The language we use around care experience can also carry stigma. And in the process of preparing for this debate, I read about some work that Clack Manager Council have undertaken to make the language they use around care experience more accessible. This could be in the reports or in meetings to make sure that the young people being spoken about know what it is that people are saying and so that they can have meaningful input into their care. And this very much prompted me to go back through this speech to see if I've lived up to those accessibility standards. But it is the really simple things, things that we know make a lot of what we do more accessible. Things like not using jargon, too many abbreviations, making sure that the child or young person understands what is being said before moving on to the next topic. It could sound patronising, but the entire document is about how these little things encourage children and young people to be equal partners in their own care, to be able to participate and give their own view and experience. I know I'm rapidly running out of time, presiding officer, and there are several more things I would want to cover that I hope to be able to do so in closing. But in the interest of time, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Mackay. I now call uh, Willie Rennie again around six minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Look, of course, the Liberal Democrats recommit ourselves to the promise, and that's why we'll vote for the government's motion this afternoon. But we also will support the two amendments, in particular, Ros McCall's amendment, which I think details some of the real challenges that we face. There's no doubt that progress has been made. Who cares, Scotland, tell us it's encouraging, particularly on the rights of brothers and sisters, work to reshape the youth justice system and in challenging stigma. But there's a disconnect. I mean, when I met, along with others, the, the group of young care experienced people, they were seething. I mean, I was quite taken aback by the the anger, the degree of frustration that they felt, the, the seething at the slow pace of change, they, they left me in no doubt that they were losing faith in the promise. So it's our responsibility, I think, in this parliament to raise these issues. And it's not an attack on the promise. And it's not an attack on the system. 
It is about providing robust scrutiny and challenge to make the change, so that those young people do not feel frustrated the next time we meet them. I mean, Children First, they have said, we are still a long way from keeping the promise. In fact, they believe that the wider problems are so severe now that they have declared a childhood emergency. The Promise Oversight Board said last year that it did not believe that delivering the original aims of the Plan 21-24 is realistic by the end of the plan period. Kezia Dugdale, a former member of this parliament and a member of the board, said in a personal capacity, the experience of too many children and families is of a fractured, bureaucratic, unfeeling care system that operates only in a crisis. Now, that's certainly my anecdotal experience from my casework in my constituency, constantly changing social workers, not responding to early pleas for help, then only responding, but in a crisis. And that is repeated on numerous occasions. Who Cares Scotland, who brought those care experienced people to the Parliament, have produced, I think, an excellent, really grounded piece of evidence on the lack of progress on Plan 21-24. Now, there should be a presumption of brothers and sisters staying together, and we've heard about that already, but one in four siblings are still being separated. That's an improvement, there's no doubt, from the three in four who were separated at the start of this process in 2017. But seven councils did not know how many were separated. How could they not know? This is a main responsibility. They admitted they did not know. The promise made a commitment to end school exclusions for care-experienced children. Yet 23 local authorities say that they continue to formally and informally exclude care-experienced pupils. One has ended the practice, three will do so soon, but five didn't even answer to the main organisation that's lobbying on behalf of care-experienced young people. Restraint is supposed to end, but there is a concern from Who Cares Scotland that there's an attempt to redefine restraint as safe holding. Now, Daniel Johnson's bill, I think, could help us clarify in this area, especially as the alarming that three councils did not know how many incidents of restraint there were, and nine didn't even respond. There was also a lack of knowledge of practice in non-council facilities. So we only have limited knowledge about those facilities that the councils run. Out of 29 local authorities that responded to Who Cares, 13 said they do not currently provide independent advocacy services for care-experienced people at all stages of their lives. They are supposed to provide that. On carers, kinship and foster carers should be paid the same rate. Ten responded confirming that that was the case, but two responded saying they did not pay the same level. 75 to 108 children and young people from 28 local authorities that responded have experienced a breakdown of their adoption since the publication of the promise. Yet two councils did not even record that those breakdowns were happening. So how do we understand about how the system works if we are not recording the data that is necessary in order to, to scrutinise the system? On trauma-informed training, very important. Nine councils provide this, 11 do not know. There is a commitment to value staff, but absence rates, as we heard from Ros McCall in one particular council, were going up at a shocking rate from 65 to 78 per cent to 83 per cent. It was one council, but I know from my local authority in Fife that there are significant problems, and it is a sure sign of a system under considerable strain and through the Children Care and Justice Bill um, scrutiny in, on the committee, we found that that was certainly the case. The system is under considerable strain. Of the 32 local authorities, 10 did not provide any training on this area um, to either corporate parents, pupils or families. A thematic review from the Care Inspector just published yesterday found that whilst the rights of care experienced young people are being upheld as they move on from being in care, the experience of moving on from care envisaged by the Scottish Care Leavers Covenant has yet to be achieved for all young people. 
Variable approaches to keeping in touch also means that not all have equity of access to all the necessary information during the stages of the transition. And the Care Inspectorate found access to suitable housing was the most significant challenge. And we know that those who have had care experience have a particular problem with accessing housing anyway. Children first say too many are struggling to find help when they need it. The whole Family Wellbeing Fund was slow to get off the ground and be spent. We need it to be more transparent. We need to get it out the door so we can invest in families and making sure they're staying together. There is so much more I can say, but I hope the Minister understands that this scrutiny is essential if we are going to deliver the promise by the end of the period. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We now move to the open debate. I call first Kevin Stewart to be followed by Oliver Mundell around six minutes. Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and I'm pleased to be able uh, to speak in this debate today. Um, hard as it may be for uh, folks in the Chamber to, uh, to recognise, I was first elected to Aberdeen City Council in May of 1999, some 25 years ago. I know I look much younger, uh, presiding officer. Uh, but one of the things which uh, I was asked uh, in the first few weeks after being elected by uh, a very senior social worker at the time uh, was the question, how many children are you responsible for? Uh, and I said to that social worker that I had no kids, uh, so I was responsible for none. And I learned very quickly uh, from uh, that uh, woman that I was responsible for a great number of children. Uh, now, the word cor words corporate parenting uh, were not used in that day, but it came as a bit of a shocker to me uh, that I had responsibility for so many young people. But it was a responsibility uh, that I took very seriously indeed. So much so um, that some folk uh, said that for a while I never uh, shut up uh, about the situation. Now, some of the practical things which I came across very quickly um, were inadequate provision. Uh, in particular, in Aberdeen City at that time, um, there was far too uh, much use of care homes, uh, and many of them were not uh, 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 of any great standard at all. And one of the things which I had great pleasure in a number of years later was uh, closing the Netherhills Children's Home uh, and replacing it with a facility that was actually fit for purpose and could be called a home. And I think that all of us, uh, whether it be in this chamber or whether it be in council chambers uh, across the country, have got to realise our responsibilities that we should do the very best for the children and young people that we are responsible for. Now, I have a confession, uh, President Officer. Um, there was a, uh, a promise seminar in Aberdeen very recently. Uh, and I was unable to attend um, for good reason. But I made the effort afterwards to go and speak to the organiser, uh, Georgette Cobbin of Aberdeen Council of Voluntary Organisations, and to go and listen uh, to uh, organisations that were involved in that day. Uh, and some uh, of uh, the conversations were very, very interesting indeed. And I hope that some of the suggestions that um, I will highlight will be picked up uh, by the Minister uh, in her summing up. Um, one of the organisations that I talked to was um, Homestar Aberdeen, uh, an immense organisation, and uh, many members will have uh, experience of home start in their own constituencies. Uh, and one of the things which was said by them, which I thought was a little bit unusual, but the more I thought about it was uh, it was right, and uh, it, it picks up on what Ros McCall said about the pay gaps, um, was home start Aberdeen said that the seminar itself had been very, very good, very worthwhile, but there was a disappointment that there were no private organisations there. And I think we need to pull in 
private organisations uh, in order to help us deliver the promise. I've already spoken to that minister about that previously. Uh, I've written to Fraser McKinley uh, about that, and I think that's something uh, that we should pick up on. Um, in a visit to befriend a child, um, it was highlighted uh, the differences that there were in terms of the treatment of kinship carers in Aberdeen City compared to Aberdeenshire. Uh, and like uh, uh, Mr Rennie's experience, um, there was that comment that far too often social workers were changed suddenly, um, which a a a can cause uh, real difficulties for families in terms of building up trust again. Now, you know, it was highlighted to me that getting support for kinship carers was easier in Aberdeenshire than in Aberdeen. Now, I think that we should ensure um, that there are the, uh, that support uh, and the knowledge is provided to kinship carers no matter where they are in the country. And another aspect of that was uh, that I was told that some kinship carers, particularly older kinship carers, were scared to go and ask for help in particular things in case um, that led to them losing uh, their uh, the children. So I think, again, we've got to take cognizance of that and ensure that people know that asking for help is the right thing to do and that they shouldn't feel threatened if they have to do so. Um, finally, um, President Officer, I think one of the key things that comes up in all of these debates is that we all have to listen. Uh, and by listening, we can make real changes to people's lives. Now, I'm going to give you an example because I talked to, uh, and more importantly, listened to uh, a young wo woman um, uh, a number of years back who um, uh, had uh, lived experience and one of the difficulties that she had experienced was council tax. Council tax came as a surprise uh, to her. I, at that particular point in time, fed that through the system um, because that was obviously a problem. And I was very pleased with the then First Minister Nicola Sturgeon announced that care experienced young folk would be exempt from council tax. Now, every single one of us in our listening can make that change, sometimes very small changes, sometimes life-changing changes. Uh, and I hope that all of us will continue to listen and to be good corporate parents. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Stewart. I now call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Claire Hockey around six minutes. Mr Mundell. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I kind of reflect and wonder now if I've been in the Parliament too long uh, because I come to these debates and I actually find them quite hard. Um, and I don't want to kind of sour the tone uh, of, of, of the debate, uh, but I feel like sometimes with topics like this, we kind of go round in circles and go through the motions, paying, paying lip service you know, to a promise. And I, I don't doubt... Uh, that the Minister is very committed in this area. You know, I have listened, uh, I have listened uh, Kevin Stewart, to, to the progress uh, that's been made. I've read uh, you know, a number of the briefings that's come in, and there are things to welcome. But I think, you know, as we look around the Chamber, uh, and to colleagues who are not here for this debate, you know, all 129 of us should be pretty ashamed uh, of the situation that still persists you know, when we hear some of the points made by uh, Willie Rennie uh, and Gillian Mackay. Uh, we're, we're not uh, keeping the promise. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're kind of, you know, I, I feel, you know, the level of action doesn't doesn't match up uh, with the commitment uh, that we've collectively made. Um, and I do worry about this chronic implementation gap that Claire Burns at Strathclyde had previously talked about. Certainly, taking intervention, Minister. I thank Mr Mundell for taking the intervention. 
I don't think anybody is arguing that we have kept the promise. We have, we, we have a journey to keep the promise by 2030. And I am very welcome of the challenges in the Chamber. That is exactly why I wanted to, to bring the debate forward, so that I could hear where members' priority areas are. But I, think, I, I don't think we can deny the fact, and we have heard some stories today, of where there has been clear progress, there has been clear change, and there are children and young people benefiting from many of the policy changes and direction that we are moving in. And I think the member would have to at least appreciate or acknowledge that fact. Robert Mundell, I can give you the time back. I, I think if the Minister was listening, she'll hear that I did say that. There are some things uh, that we, we can be pleased with, but um, I think the idea, um, and I don't want to, to be unkind in saying it, but the idea that we need to be challenged, you know, and we need to keep challenging ourselves when it comes to keeping a promise. A promise isn't like an ordinary pledge you know, that political parties or politicians make. It's of a different character and a different nature. It's not something that we should be forced to do kicking and screaming uh, or because uh, facts uh, and anecdotes from around the country make us feel uncomfortable. It's something we should be driving forward uh, at great pace. Um, and you know, the ground will probably open up and swallow me, uh, but I do uh, have a lot of respect for Nicola Sturgeon uh, in respect of this policy, because I do think uh, some of the symbolic action she took uh, whilst First Minister to speak to 1,000 uh, care experienced young people, uh, to bring them into to Butte House to spend quality time actually listening, you know, sent out a very strong message. And, you know, again, without making it too political, I do feel uh, that through the changes uh, that have happened since, the priority in this area, you know, it feels sometimes like the foot's come off the pedal um, a little bit. Um, and I don't think that's, that's good enough. I see examples in my own constituency work in the past uh, week alone. Uh, I've been contacted by a foster carer uh, who has a young person who's currently well settled and doing well at a school. And they're told by Dumfries and Galloway Council, their local authority, uh, that the council can no longer provide uh, transport for that young person uh, to get to the school where they're settled at, uh, because there's another school uh, that's nearer that could meet their educational needs. But in doing that, they completely ignore uh, all of the friendships, the bonds of attachment uh, that young person has, potential changes uh, that might come for that young person in the future. And it feels that for uh, local authorities, uh, for other bodies, uh, that the Scottish Government is responsible for, I'm not saying in terms of councils, but there are other uh, organisations uh, that the Scottish Government is directly uh, accountable and responsible for. You know, the bureaucracy that Willie Rennie talks about kicks in, and it's cost uh, and uh, an easy life culture uh, that means that these problems, when they appear, are too difficult. And it doesn't feel like the mindset shift that's needed to deliver the promise on the timescale uh, Martin Whitfield rightly talks about is coming down the line. It doesn't feel like that mind sh the mindset shift uh, has carried forward from the government uh, down to that level where things are being delivered. And that's why we end up with this uh, delivery gap. And, you know, again, I don't want to go back through the points you know, Willie Rennie listed off, you know, but the idea that we have councils that don't know where siblings are, that, that, that can't possibly be right. And, you know, there are 80 recommendations in this. Some of the easy ones have been taken forward. Some of the ones that can be most straightforwardly delivered have happened. But the promise can't be kept unless all 80 recommendations are met. And the promise can't be, uh, we can't say that we're on a journey and we're moving towards things when at this stage in the process, very basic things like actually knowing where people are and where they're based and keeping them in touch with known siblings who the state is also responsible for isn't happening. It's not, it's not good. Um, and whilst you know, I'll be voting with colleagues uh, to support the motion, I think it is right uh, that, that we do question whether or not we are going to, to, to make it, whether or not we're going to keep the promise in the timeline uh, set out uh, and whether or not uh, the things that we've done today are good enough because I don't think they are. And I think a lot of young people, uh, as uh, colleagues have heard through engagement, are not happy. Uh, they don't feel uh, that we care uh, and they don't feel that we're getting it right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. I now call Claire Hawkey to be followed by Katie Clark. Around six minutes, Ms Hawkey. Thank you, President Officer. It's easy to forget what a powerful statement it was when the promise was launched and voices across the Parliament and our public services used the word love. Love is a word not often used in politics. A powerful use of language which demanded and commanded our attention and action. And at that time, we as a Parliament collectively made a promise to children and young people, they will grow up loved, safe and respected. 
Following on from the care review, the promise was a radical statement, and it was clear that nothing less than systemic change would do to deliver it. The promise sets out very clearly the case for why change was necessary and how outcomes for the care experience community could be improved by thinking, acting and investing differently. And we should be proud of the collective achievements to its aim, while still remaining clear that the focus and pace of change must be sustained. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to recognise the significant amount of positive and transformative work underway to keep the promise across Scotland that is making a difference to the lives of children and families, as well as the hard work and dedication of those delivering services day in and day out. A lot has changed from when the Keeping the Promise implementation plan was published in 2022, whether that has been services continuing to move forward from the pandemic or navigating through other challenges such as the cost of living crisis. And we should recognise that the workforce is delivering services in an often extremely difficult context. The Promise Scotland Stories of Change conference earlier this year showcased and highlighted some examples of excellent practice which is taking place across Scotland. And the same was the case during the Who Cares Scotland's Care Experience Week at the end of last month. South Lanarkshire Council, the area where my Rutherglen constituency is based, was an early adopter of the Champions Board model, a model set up to enable care experienced children and young people to articulate their views and experiences and to be heard. And it has already played a key role in helping to shape and adapt practice in my local area. Presiding officer, I would like to thank those in the care experience community in South Lanarkshire and across Scotland for their time and engagement through fora like this. Your experience and voices are imperative to making sure that change is delivered in the right way and that we make promise, uh, progress together. So far, 2024 has been a significant year for the planning and system-focused work required to keep the promise. Plan 20 to 30, uh, 24 to 30 launched in June and work to develop it continues led by the Promise Board. And Plan 20 to 30 sits in complement to the work of the Scottish Government and is founded in realistic delivery. It sets out what success will look like, what should happen next, and a route map which, crucially, has room to evolve and grow. When aiming for complex systemic change and tracking and understanding, progress can, of course, be very, very challenging. And we've heard some examples of that already today in the debate. And Plan 24 to 30 is designed to be dynamic, iterative in its structure, while being clear which bodies must work towards change, who is doing what and where collaboration must happen. And this year's programme for government shows the Scottish Government's commitment to drive progress via the multi-year approach to the whole Family Wellbeing Fund, with its vision of support being readily available to families so that they are able to access the help they need where and when they need it. The Government has confirmed its commitment this year to introduce additional local flexibility in how budgets and services can be reconfigured in the pursuit of a whole family approach. And in my home local authority of South Lanarkshire, increased investment and buy-ins has seen a range of actions move forward via the Children's Services Partnership, from the development of family support hubs to enable easier access to support, a refreshed parenting support pathway, the Pathfinders project to deliver early interventions, and more initiatives all designed to shift the focus towards supporting families via prevention and reducing the need for crisis intervention. The case for prevention over reaction is of course not a new one, nor is it an easy thing to deliver in the context of running the day-to-day -day of crucial public services, but the government's focus on a whole family approach and the action this is driving across Scotland demonstrates its power and ability to sustainably change outcomes for children and families, both now and in the future. The implementation plan also told us that a strong legislative framework would be crucial to achieve the aims of the promise and important progress has been made in key areas. This has included the incorporation of the UNCRC into Scots law, strengthening a key commitment of the promise that protecting and upholding children's rights will underpin all approaches to improving outcomes for those with care experience. And the Children's Care and Justice Bill will enable improvements to youth justice, secure care, aspects of the children's hearing system, victim services and the criminal justice system. 
and in particular provisions to end the inappropriate placement of 16 and 17 year olds in young offenders institutions and extending provisions of the children's hearing system to further uphold the rights of older children are significant steps forward. President Officer, the next few years are going to see more crucial developments in our collective drive to deliver the promise. With Plan 24 setting out a dynamic route map, the government's key strategic aims and drivers, the commitment and hard work of those on the front line of service delivery, and the voices of the care experienced at the heart of everything we do, more progress can be made and the promise kept. President Officer, I will close on the theme that I started on. Love. It must be at the core of the work that we do to fulfil the promise. And while we can debate and disagree over policy or guidelines or legislation, we must all remember at the heart of this work should be our shared commitment to improve the outcomes for children, young people, adults and families with care experience across Scotland, ensuring they do indeed feel safe, respected and loved. Thank you, Ms. Hockney. I now call Katie Clark to be followed by Rona Mackay around six minutes. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the news that the much needed promise bill will be tabled during this session in Parliament. I know this will be a relief to care experienced campaigners who have been calling for legislation to be strengthened for years to better support care experienced people throughout their lives. This has been a long time coming since the care review was launched and then the publication of the Promise Report in February 2020. There has clearly been some progress which we should all welcome and have listened to what the Minister has said. But I do wonder if we are as close to keeping the promise as we should be. We now know categorically that the first phase of the promise has failed. The objectives that were set out in Plan 21 to 24 weren't met. The research report, Is Scotland Keeping the Promise, makes clear that Scotland isn't keeping the promise that was made in 2020. We still have care experienced children being excluded from our classrooms, which leads to those children having some of the poorest attainment levels in the country while we continue to exclude care experienced children from education, this will have a huge impact on their ability to reach a positive destination when leaving school. We know that Scotland is in the grips of a housing emergency and care experienced people are twice as likely to experience homelessness. The promise states that Housing pathways for care experienced young people will include a range of affordable options that are specifically tailored to their needs and preferences. Youth homelessness will be eradicated. I think we have to wonder how close we are to keeping that promise. Scotland must avoid the monetization of the care and prevent the marketization of care was at the center of the promise as we know how greed in the care sector can lead to a race to the bottom in order to maximise profits for shareholders, and also the impact of the huge cost of private care placements has on local authority budgets. This hasn't ended. Can the Minister outline what the plan is and when that will end? Well, the decision to stop sending under 18s to Pullment is to be warmly welcomed. We also know that there can be issues in secure care settings, for example, the reports of abuse and children facing what was described as a serious risk to life at St Mary's Kenmuir. The importance of truly independent advocacy cannot be underestimated. It can have a, such an impact on the lives of care experienced people of all ages. We know that being in care as a child can have lifelong consequences. But the Scottish Government almost always put arbitrary age limits on most of the support that they offer. We need to see the introduction of a truly lifelong advocacy service to build on the good work currently done by the helpline that is run by Who Cares Scotland. That would be a radical change that would really make a difference. The Promise Scotland, an arm's length company owned by Scottish ministers, does not have any powers to hold Scotland to account on keeping the promise. 
It does not seem to take responsibility for the failure of Plan 21 to 24, despite the millions of pounds of public money which has been ploughed into the organisation. I wonder if the Minister still believes that continuing to fund this organisation and the expense of consultants attached to it is the best value for the public pound, given the policy failures which have been outlined today. We must do all we can for care experienced people. We must ensure that the Scottish Government is doing everything it can to keep the promise. This has to be a promise made and then it has to be a promise delivered. Or we have let down every care experienced person who has put their faith in us. And I think we've got to say very clearly for this group in particular, if we make a promise, we have to keep it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Clark. I now call Rona Mackay to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, children and young people across Scotland deserve the very best there is to offer in all aspects of their lives. And it's our job as members of Parliament to do everything we can to ensure that no child is left behind. One group in particular that can face challenges, as we know that many of us in this chamber can't begin to imagine our children from a care experience background. This presiding officer is why the promise to care experienced children and young people that they will grow up loved, safe and respected is such an important commitment agreed upon by all parties across this chamber. Since that initial commitment in 2020, we have seen immense changes to the world we live in, not least the COVID pandemic. This in turn has a direct impact on all our young people, but the Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to delivering on the promise to care experienced youngsters by 2030. The promise drives the Government to implement transformational change that will look to, to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up and to ensure every child feels safe, loved, respected and able to achieve their full potential. And that's why I'm delighted that the Scottish Government since 2020 has spent £235 million on, promise, on promise-related uh, initiatives, including the Prom Promise Scotland, Whole Family Wellbeing Fund and the Scottish Recommended Allowance for Foster and Kinship Carers. Presiding officer, last weekend I had the pleasure to meet a friend of my granddaughter and I'm sure she will reach her full potential. In fact, I'd go so far as to say she has the potential to be a future leader. Alishba Malik is 13 and probably the most focused and driven young girl I've ever met. She's her future planned out. She told me she'll go to Glasgow University to study English and politics. Politics is a subject she is passionate about. She even has an internship at Harvard lined up and there are no limits as to how high she wants to fly. Alishpa is care experienced and we talked about the promise, who cares Scotland and what they both mean to her. She's inspirational and I am in awe of her. Now I realise not every youngster has the confidence or self-belief to the level of Alishpa, but I do tell her story to highlight that it can be done with love and support and that work being done in the promise is working for youngsters of all backgrounds. The Independent Care Review told Scotland what change was required and the Government is delivering that change. The key areas are listening to children, families and care experienced adults and placing them at the centre of decisions which affect them. This includes redesigning the children's hearing system for which I volunteered 12 years ago and transforming the way children and families are supported. We know that sibling relationships and attachment are crucial and where possible, keeping siblings together. And I agree with Oliver Mandel and about local authorities not having a record, and that's simply not acceptable. Support for young people moving from care into adulthood is imperative, as is removing stigma and creating a positive attitude around language used when talking about care experienced. I welcome the continuation of care experienced student bursaries, which have been available to students in higher education since 2017 to 18, and for students in further education since 2018 to 19. And that really does help to close the attainment gap. However, we can't be complacent as we approach the midway point to 2030. Much more must be done so that change can be felt more consistently in the lives of care experienced children, young people, and families. While recognising that so much progress has been made so far, the shifting economic context and the persistence of poverty 
means that for Scotland to achieve its collective ambition, we do need to step up the pace. And I acknowledge the issues raised by many throughout the Chamber and by Who Cares Scotland. It is crucial not to lose the overall vision for transformation, all, uh, transformational change set out by the Independent Care Review, which does outline a smaller, more specialised care system. So, presiding officer, the promise will ensure that those who need it can receive person-centred support, place-based activity and universal service provision. As we have heard earlier this year, Plan 2430 was launched to map the responsibilities, timelines and, res and uh, it requires the promise to be on the roadmap to success for Scotland's care system and makes clear its responsibilities. This, almost demonstrates to, this also demonstrates to organisations the flexible and dynamic approach that will be necessary to ensure families receive appropriate support. The promise also aims to reduce the number of children in care while ensure, ensuring that those in care receive more positive experiences. But to achieve this, we will require a consistent approach that revolves around values and understanding across workforce to ensure that the right support is available for care experienced young people whenever they need it. And success is also dependent on our ability to shift from intervention to prevention to ensure that families receive the support they need before reaching crisis point. The Children's Care and Justice Bill and the forthcoming Promise Bill will build on what has already been achieved. Presiding officer, the Promise has the ability to change the lives of thousands of care experienced young people across Scotland for the better. And it's a promise we are determined to keep for children that deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call Foisal Chowdhury to be followed by Nicola Sturgeon. Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Four years have passed since the introduction of the promise. While I was not a member of the Parliament at that time, I was pleased to see parties united in the shared ambition that care, experienced children and young people grow up safe, loved and respected. I join members in reaffirming uh, my commitment to that today. I spoke during the debate on the implementation plan for the Promise 2 two years ago. I discussed several areas then and will come back to some today. I will first focus on the workforce involved in care. The promise highlighted that many in the workforce were overwhelmed and anxious. Boxed in my, my professional language, which made it difficult to build relationships with young people and their families. The February Who Cares Scotland report on the promise found that 22 local authorities have implemented the stigmatizing uh, language into their practice. 27 have training for school staff and around understanding care experiences. However, training levels differ and are not always mandatory. These are positive steps, but improvements need to be across the board. We cannot have a postcode lottery of support for care experienced young people. Members will note the impact of care experience on education prospects. The most recent outcome data for looked after children shows attainment gaps and the attendance rate down 3.5% year on year. This is greatly concerning. These are key outcomes. If the promise is to be delivered, then improvement is needed urgently. Education and training can do a great deal in tackling prejudice and create the conditions for care experienced people to succeed. This extends to my next point. Project Esperanza, who I hosted a roundtable with earlier this year, offer training to practitioners to deliver race and faith sensitive service. The promise called for shifts in culture around care. This should include building an understanding and anti-racist culture. Training around race and faith for social worker is needed. The promise must be fulfilled for all, 
including minority ethnicities, who are overrepresented in the care system. Supporting the workforce with training around stigma and the care experience is one of the themes of Plan 2430. We should be putting that into practice over the next five years. I now come to the vital role third sector organizations play. The Promise Oversight Board's second report called for a greater use of the support provided by the third sector partners. This should be taken on board. I note that the Scottish Government delivers funding to third sector organizations via the Promise Partnership Fund and other funding streams. The CORA Foundation, who administers uh, the Promise Partnership Fund, found 36% of the organizations in receipt of funding experiencing staffing issues, including burnout, and 39% uh, stating short funding cycle and time constraining affecting work on the system change. I recognize these are common issues across third sector organizations, but their key role in delivering the promise should be recognized and treated as such. I want to conclude by uh, discussing data. The promise noted that there were a range of data sources that were not always shared between agencies. I also I will, it also recommended that we improve the quality and com uh, completeness of the data. The blueprint on the creation and control of data was due to release in June 2023, but has yet to be delivered. While care should be led by those who receive it, a strong data env uh, environment can inform future practice and allow for greater transparency. Ultimately, many of the issues raised today can be resolved through legislation. Today's debate and the first approaching uh, target for 2030 make it all the more clear that the Promise Bill is needed. Members know how serious the wide-ranging uh, this subject is and how important it is we uh, get it right. We, can, we cannot let the Promise be broken. We cannot let down our young people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chaudhry. And I now call Nicola Sturgeon. Ms. Sturgeon. Uh, there are few, if any, issues uh, which matter more to me than this one. I know that is true for the Minister too, and I commend her for her leadership uh, on this mission. Uh, the promise is not just another government policy. It is much more fundamental than that, of a, a different character, as I think Oliver Mundell said in his contribution. It was a solemn commitment that we made, all of us made, to some of the most vulnerable children and young people in our country. I promise to these children and young people that they will grow up loved and valued with the same life chances as their non-care experienced peers. And as the person who, when First Minister, metaphorically and in many cases literally looked young people in the eye and made this promise, I feel a heavy responsibility to see it delivered in full. Uh, indeed, some of the young people I met in the early stage of this work are in the gallery today, and I want them to know that I will always stand uh, with them and with their peers across the country. I also want to pay tribute to the Promise organisation, to Fiona Duncan, Fraser McKinley, the Oversight Board. Uh, I believe they are doing uh, vital and very good work. But it's not just down to the Promise organisation, it's down to all of us. I feel this responsibility no less heavily today than I did when I was in government. Uh, I feel it even though, though I no longer have government responsibilities. And actually, I think that is appropriate because the promise will not be delivered by government action alone. Uh, of course, government must inspire, provide leadership and funding, a topic I will return to, and hold public services to account. But delivery actually is down to each and every one of us. It requires a whole system, whole society approach. 
Uh, now, as we approach the midway point to 2030, by when the promise must be delivered, and I say that deliberately, must be delivered, there is much to be positive about. The care experienced student bursary, for example, ending the incarceration of young people in Palmont, progress towards the care lever payment, the new allowance for fostering kinship carers. All of these are important. But what is also important, perhaps actually more important than any individual initiative, is to challenge ourselves to make sure that these measures are adding up to more than the sum of their parts. Is the plethora of tactical interventions, vital though they might be, delivering the strategic change we need to see, delivering the transformation for care experienced young people that the promise is all about? That's a question that we must always have at the forefront of our minds. Now, I am optimistic. I firmly believe that uh, with the right strategy, leadership and funding in place, the promise is deliverable by 2030. But, and this is a significant but, believing that it is deliverable is not the same as being convinced yet that it will be delivered. At this stage, I think that is a much more open question, which is why it is so vital in this moment that we significantly increase the scale and the pace of change. And I actually agree with many of the more challenging points that have been made across the chamber today. Uh, we must decide collectively as one parliament today that the breaking of this promise is not an option that we are willing to countenance. Uh, there are many issues I could focus on today, but in the time I have, I want to mention three. Uh, first, prevention. Delivering on the promise depends on significantly reducing the number of young people going into care, building on progress that has already been made. That means supporting families to stay together, helping them overcome the challenges that often force them apart, addressing the long-term drivers of family breakdown, and doing so in a way that is real, meaningful and accessible in a preventative way, not just as a response to crisis. And central to that, absolutely critical to that, is the whole family Wellbeing Fund. Uh, the down payments that have been made are welcome. The money is already supporting positive change. But it is disappointing, profoundly disappointing, and it does potentially jeopardise delivery of the promise that the full £500 million is not going to be delivered by the end of this Parliament. Now, I understand more than most the financial challenges that the Government is facing, but I very much hope Firstly, that the forthcoming budget significantly increases the amount available in the next financial year so that as much as possible is delivered in this Parliament. And secondly, that we have a clear deadline uh, for delivery in full. To be blunt, the commitment must be delivered in full uh, well enough in advance of 2030 for it to have sufficient impact by 2030. Uh, my second point is about the need to radically improve the experience of those young people for whom state care is unavoidable and to listen to their lived experience as we do so. We know what needs to be done, ending sibling separation. Uh, one in four uh, separated is still far too many. Ending, not redefining the use of restraint, reducing school exclusions, just some examples. Um, a number of PQs I asked recently confirmed that we still don't have clear enough data to know how much progress is or is not being made uh, and to hold public authorities to account. And I agree with Oliver Mundell, Willie Rennie and others. It is simply not acceptable for any local authority not to be able to answer these questions. Um, and I believe that that uh, particular aspect is urgent so that we can hold ourselves to account and hold others to account as well. Uh, my final point, presiding officer, is this. Whatever our disagreements in this chamber, and let's face it, there are many, uh, or indeed in council chambers across the country, this is a mission that should and must unite us all. Uh, making a promise, and I know this again, perhaps more than most, always easier to make a promise than to deliver on that promise. But we will be much more likely as a nation to do so if we approach it on a genuine cross-party basis, as I believe we have done uh, so far. But I agree with those who have said that that can't be in a lowest common denominator way or a, a not rocking the boat way. It has to be in a way that provides the constructive challenge that will drive delivery. 
Uh, the promise has so much support outside this chamber. Indeed, it has massive support and interest across the world. Uh, there are many, countless governments looking to Scotland to see what we achieve here. That support and commitment must be replicated in here. Uh, to be blunt and in conclusion, presiding officer, we must not let the care community down. It would be unconscionable for us to do so. So today, let's recommit to keeping the promise, but more importantly, let's recommit to doing whatever it takes to keep that promise in full. Thank you, Ms Sturgeon. Uh, we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Julian Mackay to close on behalf of the Scottish Greens. Ms Mackay is joining us remotely. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been a good debate this afternoon, a challenging one for us all, but certainly a good one. I absolutely agree with the Minister that we need to make sure that care experienced people feel that we're committed to change and as a parliament are committed to making the system better for all care experienced people. Making sure that we take that proactive approach to keep families together, to alleviate poverty and ultimately to make those families feel supported and valued is so important. I want to echo her thank you to all of those who've given their time and effort to make things better. I've referenced throughout my contributions today many stories and personal experiences people have given me to make things better for those who come after them. The sharing of those stories is selfless. Often we can't change that experience, but they often want to make it sure that it won't happen to anyone else. The definition of care experience, I think, is important. But it has to be, there has to be a balance in there. Making sure that it's specific enough to have meaning and to inform, but not so specific that it ex excludes some people's experience is really important. And I'm very glad that it's being developed with those with lived experience to ensure that that becomes a reality. I found all of Mundell's contribution very interesting. I often feel that same sense of deja vu in health debates. But I think that links to the comments from Ros McCall on pace of change. I don't think we can ever take comfort in the pace at which we're achieving change for care experienced people. Martin Whitfield made the point about how long change takes to happen and actually what that time looks like in terms of the lives of young people. I met the same young people Willie Rennie did and I think that the frustration those young people from those young people is absolutely reflective of how long it takes to see tangible change. Some of the things we've talked about this afternoon take time and there's no way around it. Some things we could certainly go quicker on and have achieved more by now. But I think we do need to consider whether we are managing expectations and giving timelines to care experienced children and young people as a whole so that they can feel in control of this whole journey too. Kevin Stewart mentioned listening and those small issues that we can do and resolve to help. We should never underestimate how things we see as relatively simple can become all-consuming for people. And while we focus on the large systemic change that needs to happen, we also need to solve the practical things too. This is especially true for those moving on from care. One of the first times I met Who Cares Scotland, young people told me of all the things they found challenging leaving care, moving into their own place and having to deal with being adults long before many of the rest of us would have had to. The little things that I took for granted that my parents had advised me on when I first moved out were often never given to these young people. This should always make us stop and not assume anyone else's experience and crucially listen to those who have already had to navigate this alone. Claire Hawhey mentioned tracking change and progress, and no one will be surprised to hear me say how crucial data is. It's hugely important, and Willie Rennie highlighted how patchy data collection is in local authorities. It's simply not good enough that we don't know how, where or why some things happen. How can we know whether these initiatives are having the effect we want without effective data collection? We won't even know if something's a problem without accurate standardised data from across the country that's collected and challenged at a national level. Local variability also needs addressed and tracking what's going on well or not in certain areas is vital to ensure that we keep the promise everywhere. Faisal Chowdhury's remarks about those from racial minorities and how people can be multiply disadvantaged is really important. We need to make sure that intersectional issues are taken into account for those young people and that we tackle all the barriers that that young people face. 
Katie Clark talked about the arbitrary limits for support for care experienced people. Many people don't understand why the age limits have been picked. For many of their peers, support from families doesn't just end at a certain date or age. And we do need to look at how we can support people throughout their lives. Giving them that value is hugely important to make them feel loved, as Rona Mackay and others mentioned. Another issue that has been highlighted with me is health inequalities for care experienced people. This again is about access and structural inequalities, but often stigma and cultural issues can be just as painful. I've previously spoken to care leavers who've become parents themselves. Their perception of judgment and extra monitoring because of their background of care experience made what should have been a positive and joyful time difficult. They felt a level of suspicion and monitoring that others didn't receive. They felt that people were concerned about how they were looking after their baby and that as a first time parent, they were under a huge amount of scrutiny and were concerned that it was implied they might not know what they're doing. I think this illustrates that actually it cannot only be the responsibility of one minister to ensure the promise fulfills its objectives. There are so many pieces that cross into so many other portfolios that we need to ensure everyone is focused on this. We also need to ensure that whatever systems we design, they're accessible for care experienced people. Nicola Sturgeon paid tribute to all of those who've given their time, experience and lived experience. We would not be at this point without all of those who've put their efforts into supporting all of us to be able to deliver on the promise. We absolutely have to live up to the expectation that they have so rightly placed on us to achieve the promise. And the Scottish Greens look forward to continuing our work with government on the bill and this issue going forward. Thank you, Ms Mackay. And I now call on Pam Duncan Glancy to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm pleased to close today's debate on the promise on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. We've heard from colleagues today, including the Minister, Rona Mackay, Foisal Chowdhury, and, as Martin Whitfield has reminded us, care experienced young people themselves, why this debate, why the promise and its delivery is so important. And in that spirit, and with that delivery in mind, Scottish Labour will support cross-party collaboration to ensure effective implementation of it and welcome the Government's commitment to introduce a, prom a promise bill in this Parliament. We look forward to working with them to ensure that this bill is the best that it can be. Because, presiding officer, the thousands of children and young people to whom this is crucial need action. And they need action at a pace and scale that, unfortunately, the government has not yet met, as colleagues, including Ros McCall in her motion and Oliver Mundell, Nicola Sturgeon and Gillian Mackay in their speeches, have all highlighted. Scotland is now almost halfway through the 10-year plan to implement the promise. And sadly, the first phase of implementation is not quite on track. And that's not just me saying this. It's a point we heard when the Education Committee met young people with experience of care, who, as Willie Rennie has told us, are angry. When we asked them if the promise would be kept, they said this. I strongly feel that the promise won't be kept. After 2030, it will keep getting pushed back and pushed back until it's unachievable. And most sadly of all to hear, one young person said, they promised too much. They should have promised half of it, and then we could achieve it, and we'd be able to add more in 2030. President officer, I don't share this information to, to bring down mood. I share this because it reminds us of the importance of the promise that we have all made. And whilst we acknowledge some progress, of course, all of us have, and we do too, concerns and progress are not just impacting daily on young people. They now seem to be impacting young people's belief in change and their aspirations, and that is something on which we must act. For them, and therefore for us, there is an urgent need to deliver actions, and with them, we ask the Government to ensure that keeping the promise remains a non-negotiable priority without delay or compromise, and that a relentless focus on action is their next step. Because simply repeating the same words over doesn't make something happen, and it doesn't, it doesn't keep promises. As Who Cares Scotland have said, whilst it is encouraging to see legislation being proposed that will benefit care experienced people, various pieces of legislation, it feels like Scotland is stuck in an implementation purgatory. Decision makers need to ensure that they don't continue to create legislation that isn't fully implemented. Presiding officer, they're right. On a lot, I'm afraid to say, we are in implementation purgatory and we must move on from that. 
particularly for care experienced young people. Indeed, years on from the publication of the Independent Care Review, almost halfway through what is supposed to be the transformative period, there are many frustrations at the pace of progress. Who Care Scotland, the Promise Oversight Board and Bernardo Scotland have all said welcoming the progress, but that still more needs to change. We need investment, not diversion of resource to plug gaps elsewhere. On housing and homelessness, as my colleague Katie Clark has pointed out, there must be high quality accommodation and support before, during and after transitions to adulthood. Yet one young person told the committee that when you leave care, there's no support after that. I was made homeless for three weeks. On whole family support, the young people who spoke to committee told us that despite some progress, too often they're still separated from their siblings. And we've heard some of that today in the chamber. And in some cases, that was for more than four years. And finally, on education, the attainment gap across Scotland is stark. But for young care experienced people, less than half of young people with experience of care have even won National Five when they leave school. They're several times less likely to be able to access higher education and they have much poorer rates of entering positive destinations after school. And that's if the government knows where they are. And we've just heard the points made around data. Presiding officer, outcomes for care experienced young people are not inevitably like this. The outcomes are this way because of a failure to make systemic change needed and a failure that puts a ceiling on opportunity. We have to change that in deeds, not words. We can't talk, tolerate, tolerate cuts to local authority budgets and programmes like MCR Pathways, which literally turn lives round for young people in care experience. We can't have a system that means young people miss out on school to attend social work meetings, impacting their education. And we can't have a system that means care experienced young people have greater risks of chronic illnesses, as Gillian Mackay just pointed out. These outcomes are unacceptable, but they're not inevitable. We must, as young people with care experience tell us, listen to them and their families. We must change how we collect data. We must change the way we speak about care experience. We must ensure a, less, a laser focus on action to recruit and support the workforce, who I'd like to also thank today. And crucially, we have to take action to address the systemic barriers they face. Presiding officer, the era of repeating words has to be over. The era of action and spreading opportunity for all must be now. In closing today, I believe, I think, all of us across this Parliament will collectively reassert our commitment to the promise, as we should and must. It's now for the Government to get on with the job, because, and the final word from me, will go to a young person from Who Care Scotland. People need to see it happening to believe it. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. And I now call on Miles Briggs to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Thank Mr. you, Briggs. Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I uh, start by thanking the organisations who have provided very helpful briefings for us all ahead of this debate and welcome to the public gallery, uh, many of the representatives as well. And as the Minister uh, stated at the, in her opening remarks, I think today is an opportunity for the whole Parliament to reaffirm our collective commitment to Scotland's children, young people, adults and families with care experience. And we've all I think, pointed towards that. However, we do need to be honest about where we are now at this point around not only keeping the promise, but indeed delivering the promise. And that's something I think all members have really emphasised. We are now at the delivery point and we need to accept that we all have that responsibility, not only as government ministers, but as members who have signed up to this from every single party in the chamber. So I do welcome the government's commitment to introducing the promise bill in this parliament. But with only 18 months left of this session, we all have a role to play in making sure that can be the best piece of legislation that it can be. And we've got a lot of questions um, across parties we want to ask over what that bill will look like, how we can shape it. But for those who are trying to deliver the promise in our councils, in education institutions, the third sector, they will push back at all of us and say, we don't have the resources. We are having cuts to our budgets. So we also need to understand that funding needs to also follow uh, the delivery of this promise. So we need to challenge ourselves. We need to challenge ministers. And although we have seen really substantial and welcome progress in, many, uh, in recent years, there is a huge amount of work to do if we're going to actually be able to say that we have kept the promise uh, by 2030. I recently met... Um, with um, a number of organisations to discuss um, the promise and 
and specifically to talk about peer support, which is being provided. And that's something I'm really passionate about and know is making a difference. Um, Scotland's only national mentoring programme for care experienced children, which is working at home or in kinship care in tandem, is managing and inspiring Scotland's young people, matching them with trained local mentors. They're working with the 280 care experienced young people and supporting them. And I think that's a great example of where the promise has already started to filter down to make sure that advocacy is something that we make sure is at the heart of progress we want to see. And that is where I hope uh, the Minister will engage um, with myself and others um, around the Bill's um, advocacy of young people. Because one of the key things, and all of us standing up as politicians making our voice heard, is making sure that children will make their own voices heard and they'll be listened to and respected. And that's something I think we still need to see a huge amount of progress made on. Children in the hearing system should be granted better access to independent advocacy to ensure that they are provided with impartial information about their rights and entitlements and be given enough space to ensure that their opinions and feelings are communicated within what is often a moving process. Now, this might require additional resources and potential changes to legislation, but I think it is important that we see that changed and that turning round of a system that the children's voice will be paramount and actually to support, I think, better decision-making by our young people as well. And so I hope there's an opportunity for, for the Minister to work with all of us um, on that bill. And that advocacy element, I think, is something I'm, I'm really passionate about seeing changes in. But this isn't just about a process, and I think that's always my concern in standing up and delivering speeches in here and everything we do in this chamber, and probably for ministers on the front bench. A process is one thing, delivering an outcome is something very different. And those policies which have changed, which are sitting in COSLA, are just that, they're sitting in COSLA. We need to see all institutions and organisations move forward at pace uh, to deliver uh, the promise. The 2017, I called and campaigned for a national kinship care payment. Only last year that was delivered. Um, the care lever payment, which ministers are bringing forward, is a really welcome step forward, and I, I do hope that can deliver. But kinship carers, often grandparents, need, I think, a different model and need to be taken into account further. Um, the Social Justice and Social Security Committee held a private, a private roundtable with kinship carers. And I remember distinctly, distinctively speaking uh, to a lady who was from Glasgow. The police arrived at her home at 3 a.m. with her half-naked grandchild, basically saying, this is your responsibility, you are the next of kin. Um, her daughter, in this case, had had an addiction, substance misuse issue. The police had intervened, brought her granddaughter to her home. And that was it. Over to you. Now, the financial support package isn't really there for a kinship carer. And actually, the concern which many kinship carers still have today, many grandparents in our society who are bringing up young people, is that if they reach out for help, social services will get involved, the children will be taken away. And so there are still barriers in our systems today to many of our um, fellow citizens who are doing their very best by our young people, keeping families together, actually reaching out for help. And we need to do something about that, because if we don't, these individuals will continue to, to not ask for help, and the outcomes for these young people will continue to not improve. So like a number of members who mentioned and touched upon um, the progress we need to make, next steps in the plan, I don't think we have a clear route to delivering 2030. I hope that's where the bill can actually uh, make that happen and we can look towards that. As Willie Rennie mentioned in, in his very excellent speech, I think, um, we are starting to see a development of a postcode lottery in the delivery of the promise. Now, I know we all hate using the words postcode lottery, but some councils, some individual leaders in our councils are really delivering progress. Others are not, and we need to see that collective work taken forward. I thought Kevin Stewart made a really important uh, contribution as well with regards to public and private relationships within the delivery um, of the promise. How can this be taken forward, especially uh, for employers? I think that's a really important aspect we all need to look towards and actually challenge the, the private sector to come and help deliver the promise as well as the public organisations we are tasking uh, with doing that. Um, there's a lot 
of uh, potential still to be delivered around housing. I recently visited Edinburgh University and was really pleased to hear the work they're doing to have wraparound housing uh, for care experienced young people for the whole year um, and not just during term time if that's what they want and that's something I think we have seen some good progress on. Um, Oliver Mundell and Nicola Sturgeon I think both made um, similar challenging speeches and I think they were both really uh, welcome for this uh, their contributions to this. There's no point us congratulating ourselves on this. We need to be honest about the delivery, the structural reforms, which are going to be difficult. And as Nicola Sturgeon said, this, this, this will need strategy, leadership and funding. But the mission um, that we should all unite behind, we have all voted for, and we need to make sure we deliver that. And to conclude, and I welcome the extra time you've given me, Deputy Presiding Officer, I don't think this requires all legislative change and as the promise uh, Scotland say in their briefing um, we must make sure that we do not see this further complicate, complicate and clutter the existing landscape so I hope the promise bill must be broad enough in scope to ensure that the required legislative changes are made for Scotland to keep the promise everywhere every day and to everyone thank you thank you Mr Briggs and I now call on Natalie Don Innes uh, to respond to the debate on behalf of the Scottish Government Minister Thank you, President Officer. And I would like to thank all members for their considered contributions throughout the debate this afternoon. I am really encouraged to hear that cross-party support to keep the promise remains strong. I um, will begin with Miles Briggs' contribution, which I welcomed and actually really welcomed the tone with which Mike, uh, sorry, Miles Briggs made his contribution. And he speaks about the Promise Bill and engagement on that Promise Bill. And in a similar fashion to my work on the Care and Justice Bill, I am fully committed to engagement with other members on this. And if they have not already, they should receive an email inviting me to discuss that with them. And I uh, appreciate the story fully that he recounted around kinship carers and the Social Justice Committee. In fact, I think I was actually actually sitting on the same Social Justice Committee that day and heard those issues live. Um, and it's, it, these are issues that I hear regularly in discussions with kinship carers. Kevin Stewart also mentioned kinship carers and the fear that they have asking for help. And I would say that this theme, as I say, has came up in conversation most recently in my meeting yesterday with KCAS. And I can assure those members who have raised this issue that I am determined to ensure kinship carers feel both supported and feel able to ask for that help. I know Gillian Mackay was looking for an update in relation to this, and I would, in the interest of time, I would be happy to provide that following the debate. Now, I thank, as I say, all members for their very, very positive contributions and at times very challenging contributions that I, as I say, expected. In terms, I'm going to try and touch on some of the, there was a lot raised, but in some of the themes that have been raised in the debate. In terms of siblings, I know that we still have work to do here, but I think it's important to put out that we are seeing an improvement in the number of siblings being kept together. An increase of 3% demonstrates that we are moving in the right direction. However, as I have said, I know we have further to go. In terms of inconsistency in local delivery, I am very, very aware of that inconsistency. And this is something that I am committed to improving because I know and I have seen the good things happening, but we need to ensure that they are happening all across Scotland. In relation to restraint, I agree that the... Of course, I will Kevin Stewart. Mr. Stewart. In terms of spreading good practice across Scotland, can I ask the Minister how we are going to achieve that because quite often we hear about absolutely amazing things going on in one place and in the next door authority something completely different is happening how do we ensure that we get some uniformity here and pushing up the best possible practice for all minister I think Plan 24 to 30 is a really good example of how that can be done and the more that that develops and the more good practice that is shared on that will help to ensure that level of consistency. There is also um, going to be progress stories of change, the progress of change um, being published that will allow further sharing of information and actually I attended a conference um, earlier uh, this year, uh, seems like longer than that now, um, where a lot of key stakeholders, local authorities, 
these third sector organisations, children and young people, came together to learn about the different things that were going on across the country. So I think it's you know, events like this and things like this that are really, really important, and we need to see more of that going forward. In terms of um, restraint, as I say, the, I, I absolutely agree that the use of restraint should always be a last resort, and I can confirm that the Care Inspectorate is currently preparing to publish data on the extent of physical restraint in residential accommodation settings this month. However, again, I know that, that we have further to go, and I will welcome discussions around this and what is required with members as we progress towards that promised bill. In relation to whole family wellbeing, I, again, I am a big supporter of this. I, it supports a huge range of activity across a comprehensive programme to enable that local system change. And CSPPs can choose how to spend this as it best meets their needs. And I have seen on the ground the impact that this has had on different services in local authority areas, show, showing that transformational change can happen. I agree with Ms Sturgeon and others, whole family wellbeing is absolutely fundamental to delivering the promise and I do recognise the urgency and our ambition is to increase the scale of this investment but of course have to take that evidence based approach to those funding decisions. In terms of progress, Mr Rennie and many others spoke to how we track progress and how we best do this. And the Promise Progress Framework, which is the quantitative data held at a national level that informs progress, is due to publish by the end of this year. And finally, Ms Hawkey made an important point in that we are in a different place now to where we were when the promise was made. We've had a cost of living crisis and a pandemic. So yes, I believe delivery has been more difficult, but that does not take away the emphasis, the focus or the determination that this government has to keep and deliver the promise. Now, as I say, I really do thank members for their challenges today. This is a journey to 2030, and even with all the progress so far and the upcoming Promise Bill, there's still some way to travel. We're learning every day. Best practice is being created, duplicated and shared. And I'm confident, in spite of having a long way to go, that we are moving in the right direction. One of the things that I think we all have a responsibility for is to raise the profile and understanding of the Promise. There can be no denial that good things are happening across local authority areas, but in terms of raising the profile, a lot of people actually still don't understand or know what the promise is or what it means, yet it impacts on every single one of us each and every day. The Follow the Money report published as part of the promise in 2020 showed that Scotland spends £942 million per year on the care system. The universal services associated with care experienced people cost a further £198 million per year. And the cost of services required by care experienced people as a result of the current failures within care are estimated to be £875 million per year. So even if you're not care experienced or don't know anyone who's care experienced, keeping the promise impacts on you. Keeping the promise, supporting families to stay together and moving towards prevention rather than reaction will have huge benefits for our children and young people, but for our entire country. And it is entirely in line with our tackling poverty agenda. A disproportionate number of children living in care are in poverty and equally tackling poverty and supporting families to thrive will see less children unable to be looked after at home. They go hand in hand with one another. In line with that, I think it's hugely important to tackle the stigma around care, something also mentioned by Gillian Mackay, and equally the understanding and awareness around what care experience actually means. So as we move forward, we must continue to ensure our actions have a real and lasting impact. And to do this, we must continue to listen to the voices of our care experience community. I feel very privileged when someone is brave enough to share their personal experience with me in the hope that they can improve things for others. It's the basis of the promise. It is the voice, the individual and the group conversations that are making a difference, which is why I think it's important to share something back. 
When I became Minister for the Promise, I actually had no idea how much this role meant to me. Of course, I got into politics because I want to change the world for the better, for an independent Scotland where children grow up happy and families are free from poverty. And I have previously highlighted some of my own personal experiences growing up in a difficult background, but I think it appropriate to do so again to drive home the point. My childhood wasn't easy. I was very young when my dad passed away. I saw the problems that drug and alcohol abuse can have from far too early an age. I witnessed domestic abuse from an early age. And something that I hadn't considered prior to my first day in this role, during periods of my life where I wasn't able to be cared for at home, I spent sometimes months at a time in an informal kinship care arrangement at my grandparents' house, who I am very thankful to have had and who are such a massive part of the reason that I am standing here today. Now, I don't say this for any sort of sympathy, and I don't pretend to understand every experience that children and young people face in Scotland, not by any means. But you can be sure, as someone who has lived through some extremely difficult experiences growing up, who has experienced a sense of unbelonging, of fear, of disconnect, that I am here and I am fighting for all the children and young people across Scotland who are facing similar issues. Doing this role every day, speaking about these things regularly, whether that be with colleagues, with care experienced people or the third sector, I will admit has been very difficult and it has raised a lot of emotions that I thought I'd dealt with. However, over and above that, this trauma has driven me to work as hard as I possibly can to facilitate change for those who need it the most. Keeping the promise is a priority for this government, but it is a personal commitment for me to do everything I can in my power to improve the lives of care experienced children and young people, to tackle poverty and to work towards a country that supports families to stay together and to be happy. I look forward to working with all children and young people, care experienced people, colleagues, third sector organisations and other stakeholders to ensure our vision to keep the promise remains laser focused. I give you my assurance that I will remain committed to driving forward that change. And I'll finish by urging members to use today's decision time to reaffirm our commitment across the Parliament to keep the promise. Thank you.